The arrival of the Indonesian president, more popular than ever, after sweeping to victory in the April election. Joko Widodo, or Jokowi as he's known, is at the start of a second and final five-year term. The challenge is immense. The world's fourth biggest population, a country of 17,000 islands, an economy that foreign investors still think is overburdened with delays and red tape. The location chosen for our interview is the city of Solo in central Java. It's Jokowi's home, where he began his business and political careers. Today is National Batik Day, which explains both the president's shirt and my own. We tour a local garment factory. It employs 38,000 people and exports around the world to companies like H&M, Uniqlo, Adidas. Do you find it embarrassing when they kiss your hand? <laughs> One of the president's priorities, he tells me, is to reform labor laws as part of a wider push to attract more foreign investment. I will ask to the parliament uh, in the end of this year. And he says he'll open up 25 sectors, among them clothing, shoes, textiles, education, and eventually telecoms and technology. <laughs> Along the way, he stops to hand out books and t-shirts to the local villagers. Next, we board the presidential helicopter because he wants to show me from the air one of his signature projects, infrastructure. Before, when we go by car to Jakarta, we need 13, 14 hours by car from Solo to Jakarta. Now, only six hours. Jokowi pledged a $300 billion spend in his first term and is promising another $400 billion for roads, railways and ports in his second term. It's not yet enough, but we also have a big project to connect yes. the toll road with the industrial zone, the toll road with the tourism zone, the toll road with the farming zone. Jokowi is a leader with big ambitions and complicated problems in the world's biggest Muslim-majority country, where reform historically has been hard to do. President Jokowi, thank you for talking to Bloomberg. Congratulations, you are about to begin a second term, so you'll be president to 2024. Let's begin with two sets of protests that are happening now. One is in Hong Kong. Are you on the side of the protesters? Or are you on the side of the police and the Chinese government? Indonesia is a democracy, so protests are normal. In a democracy, protests or demonstrations are guaranteed by the constitution. People can express their opinions about laws, about policies. There is no problem. And so, from that perspective, you would allow the protests to continue? That is guaranteed by the Indonesian constitution. It's okay to express your opinions, for example, protesting a bill or a policy. There is no problem. Talking about that, as you know, the second set of protests are in Jakarta. Um, you have the biggest student protests since 1998. And one of their targets is this new criminal bill which they say they blame on Islamic conservatives, and they say, look, it bans gay sex, it bans criticism of you, it says women cannot go out, go out after 10 o'clock. Sure, you've moved to delay that bill, surely you should just block it. Once again, this is Indonesia. Indonesia is a democracy. If we want to express our opinions, it's allowed, as long as there's no anarchy, no riots, no destroying public facilities. We've decided to delay the amendment bill of the criminal code. We want to get more feedback from the public. There are many articles in the revision that are being misinterpreted and the information received by the public is misunderstood. The other target of the demonstrators is an attempt to change the Anti-Corruption Commission, the KPK. And the bill which is being proposed by some of your allies would only allow civil servants, people who work for the government, to sit on the commission. Many people think the commission has been such a success 
because it has allowed outsiders to be on it. Surely, again, that is a bill that you should be opposing. Uh, KPK ini adalah sebuah lembaga. The KPK is an agency granted with great authority. It has extraordinary authority. Of course, there need to be checks and balances. It requires supervision. There will be a supervisory board. If people disagree with this, they can take measures or actions guaranteed by the Constitution. Because you know, the daughter of Megawati, the granddaughter of Sukarno, has just become the Speaker of the House. Are we back to feudal rule by families in Indonesia? <laughs> you must be careful. She was chosen by the people through the mechanism of elections. She becomes the Speaker as chosen by members of Parliament, by party factions. All were through democratic procedures. I think you can see what I'm driving at. Back in 2014, you were the hero of the reformers. Now you have the protesters protesting against you. Does that worry you at all? No, no, no. I think they're normal. When I was mayor of Solo, I also faced protests and demonstrations. They were normal. When I was governor of Jakarta, there were protests almost on a daily basis. Now, as the president, there are protests in front of the palace too. Sometimes I ask them to come in and I listen to what they have to say. Sometimes I don't. One way to reassure foreign investors and, and people who care about liberalism in Indonesia that you are still on the side of reformers is your cabinet. And I wondered, will you, many foreign investors are watching closely about particularly Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Can you guarantee she will be in your cabinet? <laughs> well, just wait. On October 20, there will be a presidential inauguration. The day after that, there will be the inauguration of ministers and we will introduce them. Sri Mulyani, I will tell you now, I guarantee she will be in the cabinet. And will she be finance minister? <laughs> I have not decided yet, but she will be a member of the cabinet. There are also talk around the idea of you introducing one of Indonesia's technology entrepreneurs to your cabinet. There is a very successful tech sector that you might introduce one of these entrepreneurs. Is that possible? In the future, we want to build a business community that is highly digitized based on the latest technology. Everything is going in that direction, so that businesses will be efficient. We have conveyed to business people that corporate tax will be cut to 20% from 25% to come into effect in 2021. You know that I'm going to ask you about this, that you, your taxes will only be cut in 2021. India, one of your competitors for that investment, is doing it immediately. And some people say this is the problem with Indonesia, it is not fast enough. John, you must know that we want to get good revenue in the state budget too, because our state budget deficit is at 2%, different from other countries. We still need revenue, but we need to be prudent. We have to have good calculations. We need time to implement it in 2021. With good calculations, there will be clarity for investors to invest in Indonesia. Indonesia is a huge market. We have vast natural resources. We not only export raw materials, but we have started to process them as well. Up next, reforming Indonesia's labour laws and opening up 25 sectors to foreign investment, including telecoms, technology and education. Plus, adding value downstream to the country's vast reserves of natural resources. lot of things, as you just illustrated, going right with Indonesia. You have a growth rate, I think you hope to go 5.3% next year. You've kept the fiscal deficit, as you said, quite low. But there is this huge competition for investment that was going to China to come to Indonesia. As you pointed out, Indonesia has lots of advantages, but one big problem is the labor laws. 
That is the main obstacle. The World Bank has said so. You've said so at different times. Are you going to reform them? Ya memang kita ini memang berkompetisi dengan negara-negara lain dalam We compete against other countries to attract more investors, to create more jobs. Complaints from investors on labor law are always expressed to me, especially for labor intensive sectors. They also express the need to simplify licensing. We will work on these two as soon as possible. Just to be very clear, with the labor law, a new new labor laws will only apply to the new workers, um, people who have their jobs at the moment. They will be safe with the old workers, with the old the current labor laws. Ya, memang karena arahnya memang arahnya adalah. Yes, that's the direction we're going, so that we can attract new investment and create more jobs. The direction is for new workers, so that investors can feel more comfortable investing in Indonesia. Is that your priority? Will you will you introduce that law before the end of this year? Ya, prioritas kita yang pertama memang. Yes, our first priority is the labour law. I will need to talk to the head of the labour unions. And second of all, we will propose 74 laws so we can ease things in terms of negative investment. Here's the thing. At the moment, every year, there are at least 3 million new workers in Indonesia. We must give them room so they can work and enter the job market. And second of all, we want to ensure that we respond to the complaints of investors. When you look at the battle for the money coming out of China, um, you have a very big economy. You are the 40%, I think, of Southeast Asia in terms of the economy. And yet you seem to be behind Vietnam, behind Thailand at the moment. How do you hope to change that? Yeah, tadi, kita akan ada reformasi birokrasi. Well, as I said, we will conduct a reform of the bureaucracy so that we can simplify business permits. And as I mentioned, 74 laws will be under omnibus law. When will you pass that? When will you pass the 74 omnibus? Will that happen later? Will you introduce that later this year as well? At the latest, it will be by the middle of next year. You also have this negative investment list, which you have also said that you would, um, you, you said you would fully open up 25 sectors, such as telecoms and education. But that has not happened yet. Do you have a timetable to open up those sectors where you can fully buy companies in Indonesia? Ini masih dalam proses. Perkiraan saya akhir tahun ini. It's still in process. We'll see the revision by the end of this year. For education, we will provide room for foreign universities to set up in special economic zones. Foreign hospitals with the latest technology will also be allowed in special economic zones. Also in the technology sector, we will provide room. We'll see by year end, we will see many sectors removed from the negative investment list to create more jobs. You've mentioned the issue of natural resources and you have been a champion of sort of resource nationalism. You took over Freeport and you've now put a, a ban on nickel ore being exported in a raw state. Is that your strategy, that you want these things to be made into finished products in Indonesia? First of all, Freeport, that is a business process, not a political policy. Second, for nickel, we want raw materials to be processed in Indonesia to become semi-processed or processed goods, other commodities too. We want crude palm oil to become processed goods. Why not? Jet fuel, cosmetics or soap. So will you also do the same? Will you restrict the exports of bauxite and copper um, concentrates as well? One by one. The direction we're going is that we want to establish industries to build semi-processed or processed goods and downstream industries. We no longer want to rely on raw materials. We want to have added value products. Some people would say you are copying China's industrial strategy. You have big state-owned companies and you are trying to control the production. Is, is that a fair comment of the way you think about it? We want to see how industrialization is done in Germany, so we can use it as an example, how they build their industry. 
We can also take a look at China. We want Indonesia to have a different type of industrialization because Indonesia has different raw materials. All these reforms um, will affect jobs. Um, you met your target of making 10 million new jobs in your first term. What will be your target in your second term? More or less the same, more or less the same, 10 to 12 million jobs. And in terms of those jobs, do you, do you and where they're going to be created, you've talked about agriculture still being a growth area. In most other countries, agriculture is going down. Here, do you think the number of jobs in agriculture will go up? Yeah, memang di, uh, di pertanian memang... Yes, we will see more jobs in agriculture because we have many uncultivated areas in Borneo, Sumatra, Sulawesi and Papua. The land can be for rice, cocoa, coffee and other commodities. You mentioned Germany and I think one of your targets, your biggest priority long term in this term is going to be education and human capital. Are you looking to Germany as a model on that in terms of vocational training? Yes, in the next five years, we want to focus on development of human capital. And we see Germany as a good example of building human capital through vocational schools and training. I have the experience in building a techno park when I was mayor of Solo. That can be a good example to develop skills, modern machinery for our workers. Our skills can improve, quality of our skills can also improve. Germany can be a good example. President Jokowi says that winter has arrived for the global economy. I'll be getting his thoughts on the trade war, the environment, and why he's moving Indonesia's capital to the island of Borneo. ago, exactly a year ago, you warned, you said that winter is coming to the global economy and it's got colder since, you could argue. I know that your central bank is independent, but the interest rates in Indonesia are currently 5.25%. You told us at Bloomberg a few years ago that you wanted interest rates to fall, fall, fall and keep falling. Is that still your position? Would you like to see lower interest rates, even allowing for that independence? Yeah, winter is coming. Yeah, memang di global economy sekarang ini betul-betul. <laughs> the winter is coming. Yes, right now the winter is here in the global economy. We want Bank Indonesia to be able to manage monetary policy with prudence. I need to remind you that Bank Indonesia is independent. The government will not intervene. But I think if interest rates could fall, it would be good for the real economy. But the government will not intervene. They, the Bank of Indonesia, know when to cut or to raise rates. Last time you said fall, fall, fall. This time you're just saying fall a bit. The government wants rates to fall, but the policy is up to Bank Indonesia. You talk about the global economy. The biggest thing in the global economy which hurts Indonesia, hurts the world, is the US-China dispute. And I suppose that is a dispute where people in Southeast Asia have to decide whose side they are on. Whose side do you feel as if you were on? Indonesia is in the middle. We want to get opportunities because the trade war is not good for all countries. But Indonesia wants to take opportunities so that the trade war does not negatively impact our country. We have good relations with the US and China. The most important thing is that our national interest comes first. Can I ask you a bit about the environment and the economy? The crucial subject of palm oil. You're one of the world's biggest producers, but as you know, consumers in the West are cross about the sustainability. So is the European Union. You've got big companies like Unilever and Nestle. Prices have gone down. You're Palm oil companies have withdrawn from some of the international certifications. What are you going to do about this? How can you support the palm industry? Yeah, ini memang memang sebuah masalah yang tidak ringan. We are responsible for higher crude palm oil prices. 
Several times I have sent teams to the EU to explain this. Our production is 46 million tonnes per year, but this is discriminatory. It's not supposed to be like this. Trade must be open, but the truth be told, we will fight this because this is about 16.5 million people. On that issue, one of your ministers talked about part of the pushback on this issue being that Indonesia might withdraw from the Paris Agreement on global warming. Would it ever come to that? Do you agree with that? We have signed the Paris Agreement on climate change. The palm oil industry is sustainable. What's being planted is in production areas, not in conservation areas. So sometimes if we don't go to the fields ourselves, we might have a different perception. The other problem environmental is coal. Virtually everybody agrees that dirty coal is the worst fuel. You export a lot of it. What is your strategy for the coal industry? Every year we increase renewable energy use, such as geothermal, wind power, solar power, and we reduce the use of coal. The direction we're going, by 2025 we plan for renewable energy use to reach 26%. It's already at 13% and we'll continue to keep using it more and more. Do you think of coal being a bit like palm oil? It is something that Indonesia does and where you have to protect jobs, but there is clearly an environmental problem. Yeah. In the long term, that will be the case. We want to use CPO for B20 biodiesel, B30 and B100. Biodiesel will be used more. Green fuel will be used more and more. Dependency on coal will be replaced by LPG, and then we can also reduce coal exports. You have taken the very brave step of moving the capital or moving the, a lot of the administration of the capital to um, East Kalimantan and you are going to do that, you hope, <laughs> by 2024. This has been planned since the first president and also by subsequent presidents. They wanted to relocate the capital outside Java because Java accounts for more than half of Indonesia's population. 150 million people are in Java but we have 17,000 islands. 58% of GDP is concentrated in Java. We need to distribute the population and the economy to other islands. It's not possible to have the centre in Jakarta and in Java. We are moving the capital to Kalimantan because there are no earthquakes, no floods. We want to have an efficient and effective capital where we can walk, we can ride bikes, we can use public transportation. Hopefully few people will drive cars. A green city, a smart city and a forest city. Forest city. And what will you call it? Some people think you will call it Sukarno. <laughs> Regarding the name, we will ask the public which name they think is most suitable for the new capital. But this capital must be useful for the people, the economy and for the country. One last question. You are in Solo, the region you were the mayor of. You began here as a businessman with nothing, built a big business empire, then ran for mayor, now became president. What would you like to be remembered for most? What do you think, what legacy do you want to achieve, especially in your second term? My duty is to work hard. I will leave it up to the people what they think of me. My duty is to work hard for the country, for the Indonesian people. Legacy or assessment? I will leave it up to the people. It's not up to me. President Jokowi, thank you very much for talking to Bloomberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.